Okay, I hate to be the one to stop the uh, Muppets music playing. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what that was in some variation. Um, but uh, I wanted to get started uh, our last session before lunch this morning. Um, but it looks to be a very good one. And uh, I'm going to introduce, without further ado, Adam, who's going to tell us all about Aurora and his ideas around uh, the graphical future of D. Take it away, please. Nice. All right, everyone. My name is Adam Wilson, and I am here to talk about a project that uh, Walter Strong armed me into starting about uh, September last year at uh, Going Native. And that is, how do we get graphics into D? I mean, right now you don't have anything. You might have a binding to DirectX. But uh, we wanted something that was more like uh, LibCinder, because that was the big thing at Going Native last year. So. What is Aurora? Well, simply put, it's a multi-platform creative graphics toolkit. It's, I've chosen to boost license it. That was just to be compatible with the rest of the D ecosystem. Everyone seems to be using it, so why not keep on using it? The goal is definitely hardware agnostic. I don't want you to have to say, oh, well, you have to have you know, a certain grade of, of uh, hardware to use it. Now, certain things might be faster if you do, but that's the nature of graphics. And the other major component of this is that this is a scene graph. This is not a traditional game engine style um, API. This is designed for ease of use, and object trees are fairly easy to use. So, Aurora is not a few things, and it is some very important, and that's why I put that right at the top. This is not a graphical user interface framework. This was something that came up on the forums. You know, I even said in the first line of my initial post on this thing, this is not a framework. And I got like five different posts saying, this is a framework, yay. And, uh, or no, this is a framework, bad. And you know, so I said, no, this is, that's not this. You could use it to write one. Um, most, uh, for example, uh, WPF in Windows is a scene graph API. I'm not going to make Aurora be a graphics or a user interface framework. It's a lot of work. Yes. Sorry, a scene graph is essentially a visual ref representation of the the drawing you want to create, and so all you're doing is creating a tree of objects that represent the visual you want to create. Awesome. Thank you. So. It's also not a high-performance game engine. Uh, scene graphs tend to be a little slower than, um, I mean, you can use a highly optimized scene graph in a game engine, and some do, but it's not the best design for it. And so we're explicitly saying, if you want to write a AAA game in D, go somewhere else. Um, you could use it for casual or mobile games. It, we do want it to be that fast. Um, but we're looking at other things like data visualization for uh, corporate apps, um, creative coding projects. Like I don't know if anyone here has ever heard of the Planetary application, but it was a uh, music player written for the uh, iOS platform that you know had you know solar system was your entire you know playlist, and then a planet would be you know like a artist, and then a moon was a song, and so it was just you know this really cool unrelated graphics thing, you know, it's not a game, you know, but it was just kind of creative. And another important thing that came up on the forums when I was talking about this is, what if we want to render something to a PNG and then ship it out with a website? Well, I actually want to be able to support that. And so, you know, we're going to go some directions that a game engine would never go, um, but that, you know, would be very useful to somebody writing a server application. And lastly, I added this late last night after you know thinking about it long and hard. Aurora will not be used; it will not be designed to support general-purpose GPU. So, you know, if you're running massive vector calculations on a data set, you know, for some high-performance computing purpose, sorry, that's not what we're building for you. <laughs> um, this is a graphics toolkit and not a uh, data processing toolkit. The, there's better things out there for that than this. 
So why, why do we want to build Aurora? Well, th this goes back to September last year and, and my uh, talking with Walter. There are existing libraries that do this exact thing. And three were brought, I mentioned it going native last year. Uh, that's Cinder, Processing, and Open Frameworks. All of them are written in C++. And that's good for them. It's not so good for us because of the very next line. Interfacing D with the STL is if possible, very painful. And you can, uh, Swig has an automated wrapping system that will take a few STL objects and automatically wrap them, but I, I looked at the code and said, yeah, that would just murder performance, so we're not gonna do that. Um, and manually wrapping could get better performance, but you might as well just go write your own graphics library because the amount of work it takes to actually do it is, um, not interesting, <laughs> and it's very boring. And you know the the performance penalty. Graphics is special in, in a performance area, and it's um, so we don't want to incur any undue penalties for just using our library, just to say, oh well, we were lazy and didn't want to you know actually write our own. And we then you know Walter and I we kind of talked about it for a little bit, and he said, why don't you just write it in D? Okay, we'll do that. Because now I can use every single feature of D, and there's some pretty cool features in there, and you'll start to see some of them crop up in, in the designs I have planned for this thing. And uh, the other reason is that you don't have this messy API boundary between D and the other library. Because at the end of the day, you either write this really thick wrapper that makes it look like pretty D on top, you know, or you don't, and you know you have people calling dot pdr on you know pointer on you know every string they send, and that's just not helpful. And the other thing is, this project is going to be huge. Graphics libraries are complicated in their own right. We're going to support it multi-platform, and so uh, Walter then you know he says, oh well. We can use this as a showcase for D in a large scale project. I'm like, well, works for me, you know. So there are some goals, I, but before before I say anything, I want to point out what's not on this list, and it's here very specifically. Performance. Every one of these goals is actually kind of against performance. I want it to be simple to use. Most creative graphics libraries are very easy to use. Uh, the challenge at going native was to write a game in 24 hours and about 30 people did it out of a conference of 200. So that tells you know about 15% of them were able to do it. So no experience writing graphics. That's a goal. Pick it up, start using it 24 hours later. Oh, hey, cool, I got Pac-Man running. Um, the other interesting one is that you must be able to read the API and go, oh, I'm going to draw a line of text here. Cool, got it. You know, so draw text would be an example of that. None of this, we're gonna have a cryptically short um, API call. It's just, if you have to code with two other monitors full of documentation information, as I usually do in D, it's, you know, most newbie developers don't have three monitor setups. Sorry. Um, the, then the, the reason that simple is important is because I don't want to get in the way of creativity. This is a creative graphics library, not a GUI framework, not a game engine. And so we want to keep it with this idea of simple, creative, you know, let's make it easy. And the last one is idiomatic. We're going to write this using proper D principles, safe D, immutable, con, you know, all of these things that D offers that C++ doesn't, that really even languages like C Sharp don't. So, you know, and I'm, I'm going to try and design the API so that we discourage non idiomatic use of D. If it's safe D, we're going to try and make sure that as much as possible of our interface or of our API boundary is at safe. How and so what you know we are talking about a graphics library. 
And that does mean we do have to talk about what operating systems and hardware, at least I am planning on supporting for this. We'll get into how to support earlier stuff. And as you look, you'll notice that it's actually relatively recent. You know, Windows 7 Service Pack 1 is, what, four years old, if, if that. Um, and th this was actually a major area of contention on the forums, and I'm certain that I'm going to have screaming people on the uh, uh, chat channel over what this, this list represents because OS X, 10.9, well, that's current. Why do I not want to support anything below that? Well, thanks to Apple, um, everything else before 10.9 only supports OpenGL 3.2, and that is not compatible with the minimum layer or minimum support level for DirectX 10, which is as far as I'm willing to go down for the Windows version. And so I'm trying to keep everything relatively similar. Um, and you'll note that the Android and iOS ones are, well, that's re real recent right there. D does not have great support for mobile yet, so I kind of looked at it and said, well, Okay, I'll throw it out there, and if somebody wants to build the bindings, go ahead. Um, as far as Windows goes, Windows 7 has a built-in high-performance uh, CPU-based software renderer, and I, it's actually equivalent to like a, an Intel, uh, like the actual physical chips they put in laptops a few years ago. And XP is, un, is unsupported as of April. Good riddance. I'm done with that. I don't want to write that kind of DirectX code. Vista has less than 3% market share. Again, good riddance. And the market share of OS X for all versions prior to 10.9 is 3.5%, 10.9 is 4.1, and OS X 10.8 is trending down at a fairly steady rate. So I looked at it and said, you know, if someone wants to, they can. <laughs> so here's the uh, actual feature level that we're going to be uh, targeting in terms of hardware software. Again, this is why I, I, I'm trying to go for uniformity here. It, you know, and April 2007, seven years ago. That's actually quite a bit of history in the hardware world, even for a desktop. For mobile, mo 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 we'll get into mobile in the next slide. It's a mess. Um, but the reason for all of this and, and for picking these, these higher level, um, these newer hardware and software support is that it actually reduces the scope of the project pretty significantly. I don't have to go write a complete new render path for DirectX 9 because there's this big change in how they did it all between 9 and 10. You know, you don't have to go test that render path again, and that's a big deal. And I get access to newer stuff. I can do cool things now. So these are just what I consider the minimum to call the library complete. It compiles on Linux, OS X, Windows, supports OpenGL 3.3 or DirectX 10, and you're done. Mobile hardware. So the lifespan there is roughly two years, because that's when people go to get their phones updated. And so, and the other problem with mobile hardware is, is as I was looking through it, the level of support for APIs is a complete mess. Tegra 4 doesn't even support DirectX 10, but it does support OpenGLAS 3, which is actually better than DirectX 10, and you just you, you blow your mind. It's getting better, and yet again, why I want to keep it newer, because they are starting to synchronize and match up. And because of that mess, again, I want to reduce the requirements and scope of the project. And uh, do, I was talking with uh, Ian last night, and. Apparently, GDC is the only one that actually supports cross-compiling to ARM-based systems. So, you know, it, it, the D support for those systems is there, but you know, we're we're not we're not really there to start using it in production-level code yet. So, so we're, now I'm going to talk a little bit about how I'm actually designing this thing. Um, it is very much subject to change. I just started working on this, Walter. You know, at the same time that he asked me to, you know, do this project, he said, oh, and I, you know, want you to give a talk about it, too, or at least, you know, submit one. And I'm like, okay. So I've been working on it since January, so there's not a whole lot there. Um, <laughs> and 
The, the major component, again, as I mentioned, is the scene graph API. That is actually for both immediate rendering modes and retained modes. So for just kind of edification, immediate mode, I make a change, it happens immediately on the process, on the graphics processor. Retained mode says, oh, you made this change. We'll get there eventually, usually within a few frames. That's what we try for. Um, another major uh, component I want to do is there are dozens of different um, you know, specifications. Well, okay, I'm running on a Windows RT. Well, now I need to support OpenGL ES3. Oh, okay. okay, we'll do that. So everything is being designed that you can put a version specifier in your build and the entire, the build channel just drop everything out you need for that specific um, system. And each layer of the system, and there are three of them, I'll get into that in a little bit, is designed to be used on its own. So e each layer has a dependency on the lower layers, but if you want to go all the way to the bottom, go for it. Won't stop you. And I'm building it all with static libraries, mostly because of right now the uneven support for dynamic libraries <laughs> across all these different systems, like good luck on ARM. So it, yeah, I will say that we can, if when dynamic libraries get that level of support where they're just universally work, we can talk about moving that over, but for now, static libraries, it's simpler. And this is pretty much the layering system, very simple. Um, there's actually three separate uh, repositories for the library bindings, just because there are three of them. And as I mentioned, each layer depends on the one before it. And these are all the repositories. Those are the actual names on the uh, GitHub. So you can just click through, look at the code. Right now, only DirectX and Immediate have any code in them. I am not an OpenGL guy. I was taught Windows and DirectX at school. It's what I know. It's what I'm comfortable with. However, I very definitely want to get into OpenGL and Linux programming. I just didn't have the time, you know, four months. So a system library binding is pretty much what it sounds like. External interface. Um, after I wrote this, I realized that there actually is a compile step that you have to do because of some mix-ins. So um, you do, there is a, a library that gets built, but you still have to include your system libraries and your graphics libraries. So the status of the DirectX implementation is I've written, binding, I've written bindings for 11 uh, Point one and point two, and I have complete support for uh, DirectX, the DirectX graphics infrastructure, which is kind of like the base layer of here. Get this, get this card, and tell me what it can do. Direct Write and Direct 2D. Uh, to do Direct 2D, I had to Im import a whole bunch of the Windows imaging component. Thank you, Microsoft, for depending everything on everything else, because that's what you do. Um, last night, I started working on the Direct 3D implementation or the binding. And it is largely untested, but not completely untested. I actually have, I do have some of this code running in a demo I'll show you guys later. Um, and the reason I decided to make my own is Direct Write and Direct 2D do not exist as D bindings anywhere in, on the internet. They couldn't get them. Just, okay, you know. So I had to go write my own. And the, the one available bindings, uh, Evil Rat, if you're watching, I don't know your real name, um, they don't support all minor versions of DirectX, and I wanted, you know, specific, I think DirectX 1.1. And so I said, eh, well, got to go start working on that. OpenGL, as I mentioned, I'm not an OpenGL guy. Uh, we do need bindings for 3.3 uh, and ES3. Um, the DIMOS bindings are actually in pretty good shape. They go all the way up to the current version of uh, OpenGL. However, they're just kind of all in there. One big file, no, you know, no splitting apart of the different versions, and that is actually fairly important for what we're doing, because the the idea is later on that you can specify what version of the uh, rendering pipeline you want to use as you're building your high-level application, and it falls all the way through the build process and pulls out the correct everything you need. So, the next layer is the immediate layer. And, and this one gets kind of some eyebrows raised. It is actually a mutable scene graph. So that means that 
you have your scene graph objects and they're in this nice tree, you just call into that object, make a change. It's single threaded, which is pretty typical for, excuse me, uh, most rendering uh, programs. It's also much easier to write when you're starting out. Um, the other thing that the immediate layer does that is kind of unique to it is that it handles all the interactions with the operating system, not just the graphics library, but uh, in the example I'll show you, the immediate layer is also handling all of the Windows interactions. So WinMain is, in, is, Win Main is actually in the immediate rendering layer. And, I, and I'll show you more about how that works in the demo. And you know all the messages for like, oh, you press this key are handled there. And, and there's a good reason for that. So I, I mentioned that I will that I will support you know, older systems if somebody wants to. However, you're going to have to do the work. I'm already pretty busy as it is just trying to get the scope that I've already defined uh, running. So there, there are a couple rules. First, I would like to do backports in a separate branch. However, I'd like to do them on the master repository. And this is because I want other people to test the new rendering pipeline that you're working, or at least have the option to if they need it as well. And this is to try and kind of encourage people to come in and try the new stuff. And the other rule is, if you're gonna write a backport for an older version, you have to support everything that the current, or we could call it the canonical implementation supports. You have to pass all the unit tests. Software emulation is okay. However, understand that you're probably going to lose some speed for it. Eh. That's the price you pay. So the rendering process, fairly simple. Each window provides two methods for rendering. Update scene is where you, get, where you can actually change, make changes to your scene graph. And then render is where you actually set up the render pipeline with global state and, what, and yes, these are impure functions. It's global state, can't help it. Um, update scenes called before render, and once render returns is when we hand off the scene to the actual rendering API, and the renderer will sit there and composite the image and put together all the state that you've set up. Uh, window is the default scene route. I will, there will probably be a couple others to support things like uh, um, server-side rendering where there is no window. So you just, you'll get a, a route that basically says, here's a block of bits right to them. And the other interesting thing about it is that the scene graph is passed to update scene as a parameter. It is not available publicly um, from the window because there's no, there is no, because the, to, it's to, all about controlling multi-threaded access. This is immediate mode. You can launch another thread and if you call into that, you will not only crash the operating system, but you will probably crash the graphics card too if you try and change state while it's rendering. So this is to try and protect the renderer. And it also gives the uh, underlying system a very defined place to say, do something here. So each scene object must inherit from an interface. And that's because the actual scene object, in terms of what the renderer sees, is immutable. In that the, scene, the renderer only cares about what information you're giving to it. If you need to get information out of the renderer, you have to call for it. But for just building the render, it only needs to read. And so, and this this will come back later, and you'll see and you'll see it in the next layer up. Um, however, the actual implementation is not limited to an immutable API in this, this particular case. And the immediate layer only provides the mutable implementation. Again, we'll get to that in the retained layer. You have to lock the window and we will provide, for multi-threaded applications, we will provide a methodology of doing that because the lock is specific to when update scene is called. You can and so when you lock the window, it will, if the thread is rendering, it will wait for the next render pass. If you're in the update messages, it'll wait for the next, for the next uh, 
update scene to be called. Basically, it just call it captures the lock after the messages have passed before update scene is. So, window management. It's unfortunately a detail we have to deal with. So, again, keeping with the idea of easy, easy and simple. All you, all you do is you subclass the application class. That defines the entry point, has all the window management for you know, how many windows do you actually have open. And when, whenever you make a window, wherever it is, it is added to application, thanks to some tricky code. Um, you, you, you can add a window to, you, know, you can say window test equals new window, window dot, or test dot show in a function, forget the local variable you made and it will still be remembered by the application. That's because system messaging and whatnot, it gets much easier to just say, well, this window is remembered until you tell it to close. So that Windows doesn't freak out that you just lost a, a pointer. That'd be bad. So, retain mode. And I'm going to go out on a limb here and I'm going to say that I believe this is a fairly fairly common way of designing a retain mode system. Um, it's a two-thread system where you have one thread that the user is working on, you actually pass, you know, control and, and all the Windows stuff is done on that thread. And then thread two is the actual rendering layer. Um, as a design note, we're going to prefer uh, compare and swap over locks. However, because of Haswell, we might go back to locks because of hardware lock elision. We'll see how far that actually gets in the hardware ecosystem, but it's very new, so I'm not going to make any promises there. So the basic process is modify your scene graph. You can do this at any time. There's no The scene graph is now public at this point, and you can just sit there and make any changes you want whenever you want. It'll recreate an internally stored immutable object, and this object is immutable, as in the only interfaces it provides are constructor with your parameters and then readouts. Uh, then, the, then the system will just flag as dirty. Thread two is just sitting there spinning at the speed of render. And, it, and that's all it does, is sit there and render bits. When it discovers that there is a change, it goes, okay, I need to walk this scene graph now. And it will actually walk the, unfortunately, shared uh, object graph and, and copy out those immutable objects that were recreated and then continue rendering until the next dirty flag. What this means is your program can sit there and do nothing. Your thread can stall. Rendering will keep on going. And this is why APIs like WPF are retain mode, is you can lose for, you can just lose track of time for a while and the actual application will keep on rendering. And it will only re render what's in that last scene graph it got. And it won't die until you tell it to. But you'll keep, but because of this and the fact that Thread 2 is actually managing Windows, you will have the, you know, it will still be responsive to Windows commands and whatnot. So, you know, if, if your app dies over here in this thread, you can still close it. It'll still take Windows messages. So, as I mentioned, the user scene object is what I'm saying is that it works on Thread 1. And that's the one that you mutate. You can mutate that at any time. And then every time you do mutate it, it will, because this is how immutability works, it'll have to recreate the immutable object behind it. Um, that reference, the reason, that reference is just swapped with CAS. And then thread two will walk the graph. The user scene object does not have to implement the scene object interface. It kind of sits above everything else. You can do whatever you want there. Realistically, you're going to end up with something that looks a lot like it. And the reason that I went with the immutable object uh, paradigm is that I don't want to have to write locks or cast statements on every single member. Because when you're writing graphics, there's a ton of them. A simple object in WPF, for example, has 50. The bigger ones can have over, well over 200. So that's an awful lot of locking. That's an awful lot of stalling. Let's not do that. So there are three points where you have to, where you're actually going to put a memory barrier. Every object in a scene graph has to have pointers to its child and its parent. So those will have to be 
uh, compared and swapped. Multiple child lists, so if you have an object that can take in any number of child objects, those are immutable. You add one, you recreate the whole list, swap the point of the list, and move on. And that, and that kind of gets into, you know, why this dual graph setup. I'm trying to find a balance with retain mode between speed and ease of use. And this is kind of what I came up with. So we're, we're trying to pick a path between, because I, I don't want to forget speed. It's, it's not, you know, because a simple, you know, square on the screen that renders at two frames per second isn't interesting to anybody, because if you try and add more, it'll just die. So that, that's why I picked this kind of design. By the way, this design cannot be e as easily done in C-sharp and I'm not even sure how possible it would be to do in C++. Uh, C++. I'm sure Scott would have some interesting tips on how to do this. But this is something that is most easily done in D because D has things like immutability just, and pureness built right into the language. And so I can put immutable in front of a member variable and it's immutable. I don't have to do anything more for it. Uh, um, there are no special semantics for um, multi-threading as there are in immediate mode. Be and that's because the rendering thread is hidden. All of my multi-threading is all about hiding the render from your mistakes. I can't help you with, you know, if you make your own mistake on your own stuff. So if you do interact with another thread uh, to the user thread and you don't lock and you screw something up, can't help you there. But the render will keep on going because it has that immutable copy that is in um, consistent state. So, now there, there are some implementation details here that have to be worked out, particularly around how shared works and how shared interoperates with the mutable and you know, message passing on threads and whatnot. So this may change based on any future changes in D. If there are no future changes in D, this probably won't change. So, what should you use? Well, if you're a guru, go ahead and just use the bindings. They're probably going to be the most complete ones out there because that's what we're trying to do. Um, if you are an experienced graphics developer, you can probably get away with using the immediate layer. You know, you're, uh, I mean, you probably know what you're doing. And it, you know, it will still be relatively easy to use. You're still working with a scene graph. You know, you're still, working, but, but you're still working in a kind of graphics type environment that's immediate mode that is, uh, you know, you screw up and everything dies. Um, but for most people doing most things, I'd say go ahead and use the retained layer. We're going to try and keep it as performant as possible. So if you've got a big data set that you want to display in, on a, you know, on a I saw this great demo once with the guy who's had this hand control thing for computers, and he had this data set that was cubes. And he could pull in and out of these cubes and expand a cube, and then he'd get all this data out and he could put it back. That's what the retain mode's really kind of designed for, is if you're, you're doing something that isn't graphics intensive, but still you want to work with graphics in, in a, a relatively simple, relatively performant way. Um, so, I am now going to try and uh, try to show you just a little bit of the work that has actually gone into this already. Let's see if I can make this work here. Okay. Am I going? To, am I going to have to close out of the, just escape out of the okay? And so it's it's in dual screen right now. Nah, I don't need to. If, if they can see it, that's fine. Right, you I'll can see it right up here. Put my mouse over there. Probably the first ever. It'll be off to the right or the left, not up and down. Oh. There you go. There we go. So, the first thing I'm going to show you is just the actual application just running. I promise you, it is very, very boring. Um, this, this, got, this started working on Monday night, Tuesday. There it is. 
All done. However, <laughs> however, getting there took quite a bit of time and uh, no small amount of fighting with the compiler. So now, now I want to show you the actual code that you would use to create that window. Does that look like a standard Windows application to you? Where's your WinMain? Where's all that nasty boilerplate you have to write? Thank God for the linker. That's all I have to say about that. If I go over here to entry, it's there. But notice that I switch to a different project. Immediate is actually a static library. And so, because, because I told the linker I'm making a Windows application, it went and looked for the WinMain and found it in the library. So, all you have to do then is say, I'm going to subclass this application class, which does all sorts of nastiness, and then assign it to the current in a static this, and you're done. This is in keeping with the idea of simple is better. I can teach a newbie to write that and get a window. Teaching a newbie to write this to get a window is not so easy. <laughs> okay? <laughs> that, that is a window, that, that is that window in actual decode. And just to prove that the DirectX stuff is actually in there and working when it runs, here I create a DirectX kind of a factory, which is their base object, and I enumerate every adapter on there just to make sure I can actually communicate with the subsystem without crashing all over the place. As you saw, it ran, didn't crash. So, the, and all of this is, I checked, it's almost 300 lines of code that your user would have to write, or they can write 20. I think I'll take that. <laughs> All right, so if we can go back here. All right, there we go. First of all, I need help. There's a lot of things that can be done here. Some of it's very boring work. Um, I don't know what the, how OpenGL compares to whatever OpenGL, or ES compares to whatever OpenGL desktop, I guess you could call it. Um, I have no idea how to open a window on Linux. It's not my thing. I could go find out, or I could ask one of you Linux gurus to come do what I just did there for Windows in Linux. Um, there's a lot of objects that just need to be created. Uh, for example, just render me a box, just a, a rectangle. That would actually be its own scene graph object. Render me some text, that's its own object. Because it's a graph, so you know I have to tell it where and relative to where. And then if somebody, uh, anybody, and I'm looking at you D folks out there in the world, knows OpenGL better than I do, I learned it 20 years ago? No, 15. Um, from uh, Neon Helium, if, if any of you OpenGL guys remember that. Um, OpenGL 1, and it's mass my knowledge is massively out of date. So if, if anybody else has more current knowledge of OpenGL and would, would have write rendering code for me, that'd be very useful. So some questions that came up that I don't have answers to. Can we include this into Fabas? I'd like to, but there's a pretty high bar to getting it in there. And some of the problems that came up was, I don't want to include it in Phobos if I can't use it everywhere. Well, that actually makes sense. So, I don't know if you remember many slides back, I noted, I, I had on there that there was, uh, at least on Windows, there's a tool called Direct Composition. And it is actually a set of libraries that is directed specifically at server-side image generation. You don't have a window, you just get that block of bits I was talking about and you render to it. And then it does all the compositing and will export your image to a JPEG or whatever you want. So no windows required specifically, you know, and, and that, that's important. It's not strictly dependent on having a display. 
don't want it to, you know. Well, I want it to be usable for many different tasks. And as I mentioned earlier, Windows 7 has a software render that's actually pretty good. So you don't have to have graphics hardware. I don't know how OpenGL handles this problem. I know that people have done it because I've seen very slow OpenGL renderings on Linux that are obviously not accelerated. So graphics hardware will help you. It will speed you up, but it won't, it's not required, at least in my mind. And the current naming standard is kind of whatever I wrote that, you know, that morning. Um, I'm not being very rigorous right now because it's, the development is highly iterative. You know, things are changing all over the place all the time, so I'm not caring too much. But if we are going to talk about including into Phobos, well, now we need to start following the Phobos standards because there are plenty of people who will nitpick us to death about naming conventions and other things. So, but the final question is, should we? We could just keep it as a separate package on code.dlang and say, well, this is the blessed package for graphics in D. Go use it. Um, I'm actually okay with that, but I don't know what the community thinks, what their uh, feeling is about what this kind of library should be. I think personally that graphics will be a very important thing in the future. I know that we are all command line warriors. I mean, we're D programmers. That's pretty much the only way we have to actually get anything done in D. Um, so, but at the end of the day, we write software for other people. At least I do. Now, I understand that a lot of us in this room are library writers and compiler gurus and whatnot. But I write software that is used by people who, a computer is a tool that sits over there. And it's the same tool as their wrench or their air gun. They don't see them differently. And they don't want to have to see them differently. We think they're cool. They think they're just an annoyance. And graphical applications are how we as developers communicate our ideas to non-technical users. I can't ask somebody to go run a command line if they don't even know where the terminal is. But I can say, I can point to a desktop and say, click that icon, you'll get this, this set of visual tools. So I think that graphics is critically important to the future of D. Um, and to the point where I would root for uh, Phobos inclusion. Because we need something for this. Um, th this, is, this is my roadmap, kind of how I'm mentally going, I personally am going to work on things. There's not going to be a whole lot of cool for a while. Uh, the uh, details of, I pressed a key, need to get handled first. <laughs> Sorry, you know, uh, that's, that's just how things work because, because then I can do something like, oh, you pressed the arrow key. I'll move that box up the screen by a pixel or 10 pixels or whatever. But I can't, I can't test any of this really cool stuff that the scene graph allows me to do by saying, you press the up key, okay, change box dot x minus 10 until I have that. And that, that actually goes back to, you know, I showed you this demo. I spent the past two weeks writing it, but I specifically picked this thing because it was the smallest possible unit of work that I could actually get running and tested. And that's kind of how I want to approach this project. Pick a, just pick a small task. I don't care what it is. Write it and test it. I'm not going to require that people sit down and write this expansive graph of code and say, OK, I think it works now, and then have to spend the next two weeks working through all the bugs that they're, you, know, you uncover one at a time. Um, but to make sure that you know, the graphics stuff is actually working, I will work on graphics device setup and enumeration. So you know, can I get the graphics card? Is there one? OK, if there is one, what is it? Are there three? Because some people do that. Not me, but you know. Um, we have to support. We, we have a much larger range of situations that we have to support. Do you have a monitor? Yes, no. 
Okay, well, if you don't, uh, we're not creating a window, so we have to you know, throw in an exception now when you try and create a window on a machine that doesn't have a monitor because you've got nothing to put the window on. It's going to blow up anyway. Stop it before it gets there. So then the next thing to work on is the immediate layer. Um, that's because the retained mode actually ends up using the immediate layer for its rendering tasks. And personally, I'm probably not going to do much work on 3D. 3D is this huge area. You've got the basics, okay? I translated this object, you know, 10 points that way. But you also have to get into things like animation, shading, you know? Do you have the correct shaders for that specific card? Because you can have CG for NVIDIA, or I can't even remember what ATI calls theirs. Or you can have HLSL, which is the DirectX version, but or you can have GLSL, and so and it's, it just opens up this massive area of stuff that we need to deal with. But getting 2D stuff on the screen will help solve problems for a lot of people. So, and and then of course the retained layer will just be you know one step up. I will probably not start any 2D any 3D rendering until ports are underway for other platforms for the 2D stuff. And again, I'm, I'm certain that the uh, pitchforks are flying in the IRC chat room right now. Sorry, guys. Um, but uh, again, I have to keep the project uh, scoped small because I, right now it's just me. But, and 2D is easier to deal with. So it's just the truth. And, and we can get a working system that people can start using much quicker. So just some other questions that came up, you know, how do we manage this project? Personally, I'm leaning towards just using uh, GitHub for issues and, and documentation. The, there are other options there. Um, none of them are quite as nice as the GitHub integration with everything. That's just the truth of it. And as I said, I'm one person. This project is massive. Outside, you know, it will probably end up being one of the largest projects in D at this stage. Um, I was talking with some of the guys last night, and uh, graphics engines of this magnitude are on the same level of complexity and um, scope as an uh, operating system. There will be a lot of code in this project. And because of that, A, I'll take any help I can get, and B, it's going to take more skill sets than just me to make this work. Yes, I have training in graphics and rendering. But as I mentioned, Linux, okay, I can, do a, I can do a command line in Linux, but that's easy. Getting a window in Linux, no idea. Same with OpenGL. I know OpenGL 1.0, but that's not very useful right now. Um, and Aurora does have the full support of Walter and Andre. I've, I've mentioned Walter's name quite a bit in this talk. We, we actually talk fairly regularly about graphics in D. It's important to me, and, you know, and he caught on to that and sorry, asked me if I wanted to you know, work on that. And I said, yeah, I, I do because, well, I need that. And that goes back to Andre's talk yesterday. Well, if you need it, go do it. And so I said, okay, I'll go do it. So here's your homework. And yes, I'm assigning homework because it is right before lunch and you really all aren't thinking about code, you're just thinking about your empty stomachs. I understand. And there's the link to the uh, uh, organization, I think, is what we actually made for this. And then just fork it, branch it, commit, and please submit pull requests. I'm Lightbender on GitHub and uh, D and IRC. I'm Adam Wilson everywhere else. And thanks, Andre. I'm now the graphics lieutenant for D. <laughs> I really needed another job. <laughs> right, we have plenty of time for questions. So, uh, yes, you do. <laughs> so um, if this gets included into uh, Phobos, would it mean that we need to have a um, OpenGL on Linux and DirectX installed on the computer? Um, well, so that, that's where I go back to the uh, version statement and saying, okay, well, you're on Linux now. Okay, so your version 
well, we're automatically going to detect that, of course, in D. But it's also going to say, okay, well, I want an OpenGL 32 or 43 uh, version specifier or whatnot. And then it will, okay, oh, I can build this. Here's all the code, and it builds. So, um, the, but to get included in Phobos, we would have to have Linux, OS X, and Windows, OpenGL, DirectX, and all of those before I think anybody would be really realistically interested in including it in Phobos. Uh, we had a question from the, the stream. I, I mean, I think you touched on it, but uh, you know, how applicable is this ultimately for uh, UI development? Um, so there was this, uh, a bullet point, a sub bullet point that I skipped over. Um, you could use this to create a graphical user interface framework. Um, honestly, that's one of my long-term goals for doing this project. However, that is not what Aurora is. Um, but you could build something like WPF, which is a retained mode API for Windows, uh, and it is a graphical user interface framework. It, instead of saying, draw me a box, it says, draw me a button. And then here's, how, here's the render style for that button. And so that, that would be how I would answer that. Uh, I had a one question about copying from the retained mode to the immediate mode, the immutable <laughs> copy. And I was wondering what do you do with like batch mutations? If you have a lot of mutations on the retained mode scene graph? What, that I don't know yet. The retained mode is kind of out there in the future. Um, there's a number of different ways we can tackle it. Uh, for example, I've seen it done where you would say uh, begin update, make a whole bunch of batches, and that lock that that would lock the uh, recreation from actually happening. And then when you hit end update, it says, "Oh, here I've got all these changes. Do it." You could do that. Uh, we, you know, the re retained mode is actually incredibly flexible in terms of how we implement it. The only requirement is that I have to send something immutable back to the render thread, and and how we get there is. Let's talk on the forums, I mean. A couple of people online want to know whether it could be used just for window opening and uh, event handling. Um, actually, yes, you could. Um, so I, right now, if you go on GitHub and download the immediate um, library, there will be a, there's a handle property, and you can use that to start working with Windows now. I do not expose the, um, Windows is, is done in two parts for those of you who aren't Windows people. There's the win main and then there's wind proc, which is the actual callback function for messages. I do not expose wind proc. That was in keeping with the idea of keep it simple, keep the API clean. However, that could be done in immediate mode because um, the wind proc will actually forward the system messages to you. So there are things you could do. It will probably be more limited than writing your own uh, Windows, actual Windows win main and with the actual handling. So, sure. Yeah, um, in, in the idea of including it in Phobos, how would you unit test it? Well, I, that, that's a tough question. Um, and I don't actually know because I'm not a unit test guru, but okay, you, you can render to to PNGs and then do like a comparison of pictures. Oh, you mean like a comparison of what it, uh, it should be versus what it? Auto rendering uh, that works quite well. That would work. That work. Um, I mean, it wouldn't work for testing things like window creation, but <laughs> you, get gold, you get the gold file problem where you this is the right answer, and then you update versions and they change a pixel shading, and then you have to prop it. You, you, yeah, you will run into that. It's not, it's not perfect. Um, you know, testing graphics will be hard. And it might be that we have to accept that some things don't get unit tested because there's no, fair, there's no, there's no good way to say this is a passing test versus a failing test. Some things you can, some things you can't. <laughs> no. Yeah.
So uh, how about uh, alternatives of, for example, using C SFML, which has C bindings to um, SFML library, which uh, supports out of the box um, uh, Windows, Linux, OS X, and uh, you can render directly with OpenGL. You, have, you also have like font rendering, uh, windowing applications, and you don't have to deal with uh, uh, intricacies of like standard, um, you know, the STD vector, et cetera. It's directly C API calling. There are a lot of different bindings out there. I, I know that uh, Mike Parker is going to be screaming derelict at me um, on the forums. And yes, there are a lot of things out there that can do that. Um, per, but C bindings, you started with that, right? It has a C style interface. This will have a D style interface. Um, you know, and if you wanted to, if somebody wanted to, I, you know, I was only talking about, you know, OpenGL and Linux because that tends to be the fastest render path. But if somebody wanted to, they could put uh, a, an SFML or a, a Cairo backend in there underneath as just another system level binding, if you will, and then write a render path for that. That is the whole point of using the version system to say, okay, well, I want a Cairo rendering backend. Well, now you really can write anything you want anywhere on a server or whatnot because that's what Cairo does. Um, but the goal here is to try and keep some performance in it by going directly to the metal, or as close to the metal as I can get. So adding another layer of bindings is not what we were hoping for. I mean, if somebody wants to use uh, SFML for their project, go for it. Um, I won't stop you. But Aurora is a D project, 4D, written in D. So that, that's one of the main goals behind it. So on the collaboration part, have you considered having um, perhaps a wiki of being able for users to self-select uh, um, to work on certain portions of the graphics library? Because it is such a huge undertaking to do. It might help to say, well, you know, this person or these collection of people are focusing on the keyboard um, handling part of the library. That's a great idea. I haven't gotten that far. Um, a, we could certainly set up a wiki page on, on GitHub and say, here's the list of things that need to be done. If you want to do them, put your name by them and, start, and you know, fork it and start working. Uh, you know, I would love that. That's a great idea. Yeah, that, so. I mean, especially you know, if, if I was to approach this, I'd be like, well, I could start working on this part of it, but maybe you're already working on that, you know, or mm -hmm. maybe someone else is working on it. So it, that would be helpful. Yeah it, yeah, it would, and I can work on that probably this weekend. <laughs> You said that uh, performance wasn't an explicit goal early on, I think. But um, what performance wins do you think you've had simply from having it written in D? Well, here's, I, haven't, I haven't had any yet that I can tell you about. I mean, this is very early stuff. However, what I am hoping for is that D's immutability and thread handling with immutability enables me to very quickly just flip that root pointer over to the render and say, go away. Right now, if, for example, in C++, my understanding is that would be a very expensive copy of the graph. Whereas with D, I, can, I could use a begin update, end update, do your batch, recreate the immutable graph, and, but we're only going to recreate the parts that you actually changed, and then just flip the pointer over to the renderer. So, yes, performance isn't a... Um, strict goal, but the idea is to use the features of D in such a way that performance would be, is something that happens. All right, so I think we're done. Another round of applause for you, please, Bradham. And lunch is waiting us all, uh, awaiting us all outside. We'll be back here at 1.30. See you then.